August 2023 marked a turning point in global ocean safety. Japan's government authorized the release of radioactive water from the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear facility directly into the Pacific. Four separate discharges have occurred since then. The decision triggered alarm across continents. Scientists, fishing communities, and governments questioned what this meant for marine ecosystems and the safety of seafood consumed by millions. China which imports and consumes more seafood than nearly any nation on Earth, faced a direct threat. Coastal waters could be compromised. Supply chains could collapse. Public health could be at risk. But instead of accepting contamination as inevitable, Chinese engineers and agricultural scientists pursued an idea that seemed to defy logic itself. Grow seafood thousands of kilometers from any ocean in one of the planet's most hostile environments. The Taklimakan Desert, a name that translates roughly to go in and you won't come out. This is not farmland. This is not even marginal soil. This is 330,000 square kilometers of shifting sand dunes, blistering heat, and winds so violent they lift dust nearly four kilometers into the sky. Yet today, across 7,000 acres of this barren expanse, shrimp swim in purpose-built ponds. Crabs burrow into artificial substrates. Fish thrive in water that didn't exist here a decade ago. During harvest season, workers pull 1,200 kilograms of seafood daily from pools carved into desert earth. Annual revenue exceeds 8 million US dollars. This isn't science fiction, it's operational agriculture backed by years of research, millions in investment, and a methodology that turns environmental disaster into opportunity. The Taklamakan sprawls across China's Xinjiang region, embedded in the Tarim Basin like a scar on the landscape. It ranks as China's largest desert and the world's 10th largest overall. More critically, it's the second largest shifting desert globally, meaning its dunes migrate constantly under relentless wind. The desert stretches roughly 1,000 kilometers east to west and 400 kilometers north to south. Beneath the surface lies loose alluvial sediment, hundreds of meters deep in places, with active sand layers reaching 300 meters thick. Climatically, the Taklamakan operates at extremes. It's classified as a warm, temperate, arid desert, but those words don't capture the brutality. Summer temperatures have peaked at 67.2 degrees Celsius, hot enough to cause second-degree burns on exposed skin within minutes. Day-night temperature swings routinely exceed 40 degrees Celsius. You could experience midday heat that melts plastic and midnight cold that freezes water solid, all within 24 hours. Wind defines this landscape. Two prevailing wind systems, one from the northwest, one from the north-south axis, collide here, creating turbulence and sandstorms of staggering intensity. More than 80% of the desert consists of mobile dunes, constantly reshaped by these forces. When the sun heats the surface, updrafts form. The northeast wind amplifies. Hurricanes and dust storms become routine. During peak events, airborne particles reach altitudes of 3,962 meters. Even on calm days, dust hangs perpetually in the atmosphere, giving the desert an otherworldly amber haze. This is where China chose to farm seafood. The story begins not with seafood, but with water. Since 2002, Chinese environmental agencies have worked to reverse desertification. The initial strategy seemed straightforward. Introduce water, encourage vegetation, stabilize soil. Authorities launched an annual ecological water transfer project, channeling water into the Taklamakan through a network of canals and pipelines. The goal was simple. Turn sand into soil, death into life. Year after year, water flowed. Slowly, small lakes began to form, scattered like mirrors across the dunes. Around their edges, sporadic vegetation appeared, shrubs, grasses, a few hardy trees. But progress stalled. Only narrow ribbons of green emerged near the water. The vast interior remained sterile. Scientists realized they'd misunderstood the problem. 
Water alone doesn't create an oasis. You need an ecosystem. Plants, soil organisms, nutrient cycles, biodiversity. Water is necessary, but not sufficient. Then came the breakthrough. Researchers analyzing the lakes discovered something unexpected. The water wasn't fresh. Minerals leached from the surrounding geology had increased salinity. What seemed like a setback became an opportunity. If the water was naturally saline, why not use it for saltwater aquaculture? The Chinese Academy of Sciences began testing. They didn't just pump in seawater. That would have been logistically impossible and ecologically disastrous. Instead, they formulated artificial seawater, adjusting the desert's naturally saline water with trace elements and probiotics to replicate ocean chemistry. It took years of calibration, but eventually they achieved stable parameters suitable for marine species. In 2017, after extensive trials, researchers identified their first candidate, the blue crab. This species, known scientifically for its resilience, possessed a critical survival trait, remarkable drought tolerance. When water levels drop, blue crabs enter a state of metabolic dormancy, drastically reducing their need for hydration. Bodily functions slow, feeding and reproduction cease, but they don't die. When water returns, they revive quickly, resuming normal activity as if nothing happened. This adaptation made blue crabs ideal pioneers for desert aquaculture. But you know, their value extended beyond survival. Blue crabs are prized commercially. Their meat is sweet, rich in protein, and widely consumed across Asia. They also carry cultural significance and in traditional Chinese medicine are believed to offer health benefits. Beyond economics, they're visually striking. Their shells shimmer in shades of blue and green, making them attractive to tourists and photographers. By cultivating blue crabs in the desert, China wasn't just solving a food security problem. It was creating a tourism draw, an ecological experiment, and a proof of concept, all at once. Success bred ambition. By 2020, the farming area expanded to 7,000 acres. The government established an industrial incubator park dedicated to saline alkali land aquaculture, treating the desert as a laboratory for scaling this model nationwide. The species list grew. Shrimp, various fish species, clams, and multiple crab varieties. Each addition required new adjustments. Water chemistry, feed formulations, disease management protocols. As aquaculture expanded, something remarkable happened. Plants began growing beyond the pond edges. Seeds dormant for decades, buried in the sand, germinated. Vegetation spread. Insects arrived. Birds followed. The introduction of water and organic waste from aquaculture created nutrient-rich zones. Within a few years, biodiversity began returning to areas that had been biologically dead for centuries. By 2022, desert-farmed seafood entered commercial markets. Marketing emphasized purity. These products came from a controlled environment, free from industrial pollutants, microplastics, and radioactive contamination. Consumers responded enthusiastically. Prices held above coastal equivalents despite higher production costs. Chefs praised the quality. The flavor profile was distinct, slightly different from ocean-caught specimens but equally desirable. Today, daily harvests average 400 to 500 kilograms, surging to 1,200 kilograms during peak seasons. This isn't subsistence farming. It's commercial-scale production generating substantial revenue and employment. Local communities that once survived on marginal agriculture now have access to higher-paying jobs in aquaculture, processing, and logistics. April 2024 brought the next phase. Authorities released massive quantities of juvenile seafood into newly developed farming zones at the desert's periphery. 80 million flower clam seedlings, 3 million razor clam seedlings, and 30,000 blue crab juveniles. Surveys indicated that over 100,000 acres of desert land possess suitable conditions for saline aquaculture. That's an area roughly equivalent to 400 square kilometers, almost half the size of Singapore. In May 2024, the species roster expanded again. 
Following successful trials with crayfish, salmon, and Australian freshwater lobster, scientists introduced 1 million Macrobrachium rosenbergi, giant river prawns known as South Taihu No. 3, sourced from the Freshwater Fisheries Research Institute. These prawns grow rapidly, reaching marketable size within just a few months, and command premium prices in both domestic and international markets. The environmental benefits, honestly, extend far beyond just seafood production. Desert aquaculture has become, you know, a model for water conservation. Ponds use recirculating systems that minimize evaporation and prevent contamination of groundwater. Waste products from aquatic animals fertilize adjacent vegetation. Plants, in turn, stabilize soil and help reduce erosion. The system operates as a closed loop, with each component supporting the others. This isn't China's first attempt at desert aquaculture. The concept actually has deeper roots. Back in 1990, a Chinese entrepreneur began investigating whether seafood farming could work in arid regions. After years of research, he established a 1,200-acre rainbow trout farm in the Kumtag Desert in 2001. There were 15 ponds and 600,000 fry. The Kumtag environment rivals the Taklamakan in harshness. Extreme temperatures, minimal rainfall, brutal winds. But the site had one advantage. Abundant spring water, naturally filtered through underground aquifers. Rainbow trout, which require cold, oxygen-rich water, thrived there. The farm succeeded commercially and demonstrated that with the right conditions and species selection, desert aquaculture could, in fact, work. Now, with Japan's radioactive water discharge continuing, China's desert seafood industry has gained strategic importance. Public confidence in ocean-sourced seafood has, honestly, deteriorated globally. Several nations have gone so far as to ban Japanese seafood imports outright. Others, well, they've imposed rigorous testing requirements. Consumers worldwide worry about long-term contamination spreading through ocean currents. But, you know, China's desert aquaculture offers an alternative. Seafood grown in a controlled environment, totally isolated from oceanic pollution. The Taklimakan Desert lies roughly 2,500 kilometers from the nearest coastline. No currents can carry contaminants here. No industrial runoff. No microplastic accumulation. The water chemistry is artificial, monitored continuously, and adjusted precisely. International observers are definitely paying attention. Countries facing desertification, spanning the Middle East, North Africa, Central Asia, and parts of South America, could potentially replicate this model. Saudi Arabia, with its vast desert areas and significant capital, has already expressed interest. Egypt, which battles desertification along the Nile Delta's margins, sees potential applications too. Even nations without food security concerns view this as a climate adaptation strategy, a way to create productive land from degraded ecosystems. Chinese researchers aren't stopping with aquaculture. Right now, current experiments focus on aquatic plants and seaweed cultivation. These organisms purify water, absorb excess nutrients, stabilize pH levels, and, well, produce oxygen. They also serve as feed for herbivorous aquatic species, reducing dependency on imported feed. If successful, this could close the final loop, a fully self-sustaining ecosystem, requiring minimal external inputs. The broader implications are profound. Desserts cover approximately one-third of Earth's land surface, so that's roughly 50 million square kilometers. Most are considered economically unproductive, valued primarily for mineral extraction or renewable energy installations. If even a fraction of that land could support aquaculture or complementary agriculture, global food production capacity would increase dramatically. Water remains the constraint. Desert aquaculture requires a consistent water supply, whether that's from groundwater, transferred surface water, or desalinated seawater. Energy costs for pumping and treatment are significant. Climate change complicates matters. Rising temperatures increase evaporation rates, and shifting precipitation patterns affect water availability. Yet as traditional coastal aquaculture faces mounting pressures, like pollution, 
overfishing, coastal development, and climate impacts, inland alternatives become increasingly viable. China's desert seafood industry also challenges assumptions about where food can be produced. For millennia, agriculture clustered around rivers, coastlines, and temperate zones with reliable rainfall. Technology is breaking that pattern. Vertical farms operate in urban centers. Hydroponics and aeroponics grow vegetables without soil. Insect farming converts organic waste into protein. Desert aquaculture fits this trend, using innovation to transcend geographical limitations. Critics raise valid concerns. Large-scale water diversion for desert projects could deprive downstream ecosystems, and groundwater extraction might prove unsustainable if recharge rates are insufficient. Introducing non-native species always carries ecological risks, and you know the economic viability depends on sustained government support, remove subsidies, and many operations might collapse. But proponents argue the alternatives are worse. Desertification destroys productive land, displaces communities, and exacerbates poverty. Climate change accelerates the process. Without intervention, millions of hectares will become uninhabitable wasteland within decades. Desert aquaculture doesn't just produce food. It stabilizes regions, creates employment, and prevents humanitarian crises. The Taklimakan project represents something larger than seafood farming. It's a test case for human adaptability, for whether technology and ecology can coexist for whether we can repair damage done to the planet rather than simply exploiting what remains. The desert that once meant only death now sustains life. The sand that buried ancient Silk Road cities now cradles ponds teeming with shrimp and crabs. Perhaps the most striking aspect is the speed of transformation. Two decades ago, this idea existed only in research papers and speculative proposals. Today, it's operational infrastructure generating revenue and employment. Children who grew up seeing only sand now watch fish swim beneath the desert sun. Communities that relied on subsistence herding now operate sophisticated aquaculture facilities. The impossible became routine so quickly that we risk forgetting how extraordinary it truly is. Japan's decision to release radioactive water may have accelerated China's commitment to desert aquaculture, but the underlying logic transcends geopolitics. The world's population will reach nearly 10 billion by 2050. Oceans are overfished, warming, acidifying. Coastal areas face rising seas and intensifying storms. We need alternative food sources, resilient to climate disruption and environmental contamination. The Taklamakan Desert, once a symbol of desolation, now offers a different narrative. One where human ingenuity turns scarcity into abundance. Where barren land becomes productive. Where crises spark innovation rather than collapse. The crabs crawling across those desert pond floors carry a message. Adaptation is possible. The question is whether we'll embrace it broadly enough, quickly enough, to matter.